Welcome to Watchmen on the Wall, a daily outreach of Southwest Radio Ministries and SWRC.com. Today, Josh Davis calls the church to wake up from spiritual slumber as he concludes our series, Rise of the One World Mind. How are you doing today, my friend? Do you need prayer? We're here for you, and we're ready to pray with you. Call 1-800-652-1144 and share your prayer need. Or you can email us, prayer at swrc.com. That's prayer at swrc.com. Please remember, your friends at Watchmen on the Wall are here for you. God is still on the throne, and prayer changes things. And to be fully equipped with the latest resources, be sure to check out our website, swrc.com. There you'll find the latest books and DVDs designed to inform and strengthen your faith, swrc.com. Josh Davis returns now and calls the church to wake up from spiritual slumber. Ezekiel describes the biblical responsibility of a watchman on the wall. If the watchman fell asleep and failed to warn the people of approaching danger, God would hold him personally responsible for their deaths. Is the American church doing the same thing today? On yesterday's program, we looked at Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13, and gave a truly gospel message and an appeal for those who have not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ to make that decision. And friends, I want to invite you, if you've made that decision, please reach out to us. Prayer at swrc.com is an email address. We'd love to celebrate with you. We'd love to give you some encouragement from God's Word. And you can reach us by phone, 1-800-652-1144, if you'd like to talk with us over the phone as well. I want to go back to that passage today as we're talking about what do we do as we watch the rise of globalism? How do we respond? That first appeal was to those who do not know Jesus. They're not ready for the rapture. They're not ready for what's coming. And that's what we need most of all. That's the most important part of that. But today I want to go back to that passage because Jesus wasn't just talking to Judas Iscariot when he gave that parable. He was talking to all of the twelve. And I want to point out the ending of this parable. We didn't mention it yesterday, but in verse 13, Jesus tells them as he summarizes this teaching in verses 1 to 13 of Matthew 25 as part of his Olivet Discourse, Jesus ends with a warning. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. And so to whom is Jesus aiming these words? You know, if I gave you a multiple choice test, would the answer be Judas Iscariot, the eleven, or all the above? Well, the correct answer is all the above. And so recall from the parable that all the wise and foolish bridesmaids fell asleep while they awaited the call to go meet the groom. The foolish should have prepared before the call came, but they fell asleep. The wise should have been watching. They should have been waiting, but they too fell asleep. So both the wise and the foolish could have dealt with this lack of oil and discussed the need for a relationship with the groom before the call came. However, both groups grew tired of waiting for the groom, and it just seemed to delay, delay, delay. Well, he should have been here by now. Man, I expected him a long time ago. Maybe he's not coming. Let's just get a little bit of rest. And they all became tired. They all fell asleep. When the call came, it was too late to make any changes. It was too late to make any other preparations. The call came, that was the time of action, that was a time of response, and it was too late to do anything else. And so, as I said on yesterday, I gave an urgent appeal to those who are like the foolish bridesmaids or Judas Iscariot to repent from sin, to turn to Jesus for salvation. But there's an urgent appeal for the believers, like the wise bridesmaids, to awaken out of sleep. Even the wise fell asleep on the job. The church, the bride of Christ, has a responsibility in this world today. Many people alive are not prepared for eternity and have churches fallen asleep thinking, where's the promise of his coming? You know, preachers have been talking about the rapture. 
They've been talking about the rise of the one world mind. They've been talking about these kinds of things for decades. So there's a temptation for Christians to think, here we go again, another sermon about Bible prophecy. I've heard this all my life. Here we go, here we go, here we go. And we doze off to sleep while we go through the religious motions. The wise bridesmaids were dressed. They were equipped with everything they needed. And then they fell asleep. And some believers are satisfied that they've got their ticket punched to heaven and they've fallen asleep while the world perishes around them. What a stinging indictment on the church today. Should not the wise bridesmaids have been more concerned about the foolish? I'm sure they had to notice that they weren't prepared to meet the groom. The wise had something that the foolish didn't. Didn't they care enough about the foolish to alert them? Hey, you're missing something. Do you have any oil with you? How are you going to burn those lamps? Again, the lack of oil was an indication of a lack of a relationship with the groom. But the wise, didn't they care enough about the foolish to alert them to this need? While there was still time, while there was still an opportunity to do something about it? And so as we observe the rise of the one world mind, The church cannot and must not sit on her hands and stay asleep until the rapture. And you know, some people who dog the premillennial and pre-tribulation view of the rapture say, well, you just give an excuse for Christians to do nothing, to sit back. I, I, I say the total opposite. I say if there's a view that should propel the church to action, it's the belief that the rapture is imminent that the rapture could happen at any moment, and that we have a short window of opportunity. We don't know how long it's going to remain open, but we have a chance to get out the gospel as far and as wide as we possibly can while this window of opportunity is open. And yes, our world is being conditioned to fall asleep, to just receive the Antichrist system, to just go along with this plan. Don't open your eyes. Don't wake up. Stay asleep. Stay foolish and stay with the plan. That's the enemy's agenda. That's the enemy's system. This does not absolve the church's responsibility to remain awake and alert to the world and alerting the world to what's happening all around us. And I pray that in some small way that this book, Rise of the One World Mind, will serve the church and will serve the world to this end. Even before I started writing this book, I began to pray, Lord, please open people's eyes. And from the outset of this book, I opened it by saying that my eyes were mostly closed as I was nodding off to sleep. Thankfully, the Lord woke me up before I started snoring and before I was out cold. And I pray that if you're like me, where I was a few years ago, that you will wake up too and that you will open your eyes and you will understand the lateness of the hour and the urgency of this moment to do everything that we can to get the gospel out and to share the good news of Jesus. Let me give you a personal example of what the scripture talks about when it talks about they slumbered and they slept. In this parable from Matthew chapter 25, they all slumbered and slept. I mentioned on yesterday's program The word slumber has to do with nodding off. It's when you're dozing off to sleep. And then slept is just when you're out cold, dead asleep, as they say. I was about 45 minutes from home. It had been a very busy Saturday at the end of a busy week. I was a seminary student. I lived near Charlotte, North Carolina at that time. It was about a three to three and a half hour drive home, depending on traffic, depending on several different circumstances. So I worked every single Saturday when I lived there in Charlotte and was a seminary student, and I worked around my school hours and different things like that. But every single Saturday, I would spend working to try to make some money to pay rent and different things like that. So after my work shift, I go home, change clothes, grab my stuff, and hit the road over three hours to get back home for the Saturday evening spend Sunday with my family, turn around, drive back Sunday night. I'm about 45 minutes from home, driving in the dark on the interstate, and I begin to nod off. Have you ever experienced that? 
and my eyes closed for a couple seconds. My head began to drop. I popped back awake instantly, and I experienced that several times in a row. Finally, my chin hits my chest, and I popped awake with that surge of adrenaline, you know, and I knew right then and right there, I need to pull off this road before I kill myself or before I kill someone else. So I I pull off, stop at a convenience store, got a glass bottle that's got that strong coffee with sugar and chocolate and everything else mixed in. The sugar kicked in, the caffeine kicked in. I was awake. I was able to drive the rest of the way safely home. And I think that's a good analogy of what I'm afraid for many Christians. Now, I'm afraid that many Christians are living that kind of spiritual life. We're heading home to be with Jesus forever, but the closer we get to home, the more we're nodding off. The more tired we grow, the closer we get to home. It's dangerous for us. It's dangerous for others around us. Oh, Lord, please open our eyes. Let that be our prayer. You know, here at Southwest Radio Ministries, our daily audio program is called Watchmen on the Wall. And God prophesied through Ezekiel that he would give Israel a watchman to look out for the approaching enemies. You can read about that in Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 1 to 9. For the sake of time, I'm just going to paraphrase what those powerful verses contain. Again, that's Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 1 to 9. I encourage you to read that and think through that important passage. So this is basically what it teaches in those nine verses. A watchman had a solemn responsibility before God, and when he saw the enemy coming, he was instructed to blow the trumpet and warn the people. And if the people ignored the trumpet of the watchman, their doom was on their own heads. But if the watchman saw an approaching enemy but did not warn the people, God would hold the watchman guilty for the death of anyone who was killed by this enemy under his watch. This is a very serious responsibility to be a watchman on the wall. It cannot be taken lightly. You know, I've seen an increase in people who are saying that I'm a watchman. I'm a watchman. I'm a watchman. So before we assume this responsibility, we got to first consider what we're placing ourselves under. Don't call yourself a watchman unless you want this responsibility before Almighty God. You know, imagine that there's a watchman that sat on the city wall night after night, nothing but a few scurrying animals to watch. He's been told the enemy may be out there. Be watchful, be watching and waiting. He nods off to sleep one night and the next night and the next night, taking little naps. Here and there, nobody knows that the watchman is asleep. They're all asleep too. They're trusting their lives into the hands of this watchman. They're entrusting him with their very lives, and they believe that he's on the wall watching, and he's going to blow the trumpet, and he'll sound the alarm. Surely he'll sound the alarm. If something happens, he'll wake us up. He'll let us know what's going on. They trust that he's watching, that he's awake. But as the enemy attacks and kills the unsuspecting people, because he fell asleep. The watchman woke up too late to blow the trumpet, too late to warn the people, and God promised that the blood would be upon the watchman's hands. As God told Ezekiel that he made him a watchman over the house of Israel in verse 7 of Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel had the responsibility to warn the people about God's judgment coming upon them because of their sins. If he kept quiet, God would hold him as guilty. What a serious responsibility it is to be a watchman. And the pastors who remain silent about sin are simply sleeping watchmen. God's going to hold them responsible for not warning the people about the dangers of sin. And while there is pressure on pastors to remain silent in the face of evil, they have to remember that God will not hold them guiltless for people's spiritual destruction. And there are some faithful watchmen who are warning the people, yet the warnings are ignored by the hearers. These watchmen have done their job in the eyes of the Lord. Their responsibility is on the head of those who ignore that warning. And so we all have a responsibility before God with what we're going to do with the message that we've heard. Now, let me offer this qualifier. This does not give the watchman, this does not give a pastor a license to shear the sheep every message. 
There's a difference between sounding the trumpet of warning and constantly berating God's flock. See, pastors are under shepherds, not overlords. And so I wanted to make that qualification. And here's an important statement that I hope that you will grasp. All pastors are watchmen, but not all watchmen are pastors. Let me say that again, and I'll explain what I mean by that. All pastors are watchmen, but not all watchmen are pastors. You see, if if you are called to be a pastor of a church, you are automatically set in the position as a watchman on the wall for that particular congregation. But you can be a watchman and not be a pastor. There are many faithful Christians who share messages in various means through various platforms to warn their families, to warn their friends, to warn others about the approaching dangers and those people that are under their sphere of influence. So it's a wonderful thing that they've taken up this responsibility However, I want to urge every watchman to consider the Lord's warning if they fail to sound this trumpet. The five wise bridesmaids failed to sound the trumpet. They fell asleep. They disregarded their responsibility as watchmen. And could the blood of the five foolish who were left out, could that blood be on the hands of the five wise who failed to sound a warning, who failed to blow the trumpet? That's a very sobering question that we have to consider before we want to become a watchman. And so I encourage you, if you want to become a watchman on the wall, do not enter it lightly. Do not enter it without spending time in prayer. But you can be a watchman for your family, a watchman for your co-workers, a watchman for your classmates, a watchman for your church family, a watchman in your neighborhood, your community, your country, around this world. So how do you become a watchman? First, it begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is the very first step that must be taken and that must be followed. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus, it does no good to open your eyes to what's happening around the world. I'm sorry to be so blunt about that, but that's the simple fact of the matter. You need to be prepared for eternity by putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where it all begins. But secondly, you've got to open your eyes to what's happening around us. That's going to look different for everyone based on where you live and your circumstances of your life. Open your eyes to the reality of what's happening around you. Third, fix your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is so crucial. Don't spend all your time looking at the problems. Glance at the problems, but keep your eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Fourthly, call others to look to Jesus. As you speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4.15, it's one thing to speak the truth, but it's quite another to speak the truth in love. And we are called to do that, called to speak the truth in love. Let me share this last admonition with you. Light always conquers darkness. Here we are in these days, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. We have the light of life, the Lord Jesus Christ. I envision today's church like a lighthouse built upon the solid rock, this solid foundation that is sure and steadfast and immovable, and that rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are shining like a lighthouse into the fog, into the darkness all around us. People are on the water in boats, trying to find the way to the light, trying to find the way to the truth. And as the church, we have the true light of the gospel, and we can shine that forth into this dark world to show them there is a way. You see, darkness is just the absence of light. And we have the light of life. May we let that light shine so brightly into this present darkness and that we would see great spiritual victories unfold before our eyes in this day that we live in. The greatest preparation we can make against the rise of the one world mind is spiritual preparation. The only way to be spiritually ready is to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Friends, are you ready for the rapture? Josh Davis's new book, Rise of the One World Mind, will equip and prepare you to be ready for what is coming. Unmasking the agendas at work in our world, well, it seems intimidating. Fear threatens us into silent submission. Guilt tricks our emotions to get on board with the global agenda. However, we don't need to be scared or intimidated. More than merely listing the problems with the One World Mind, Josh's new book, seeks to offer solutions. This is not the time to go into hiding. Rather, this is the time to stand boldly upon God's truth. 
Some of the solutions offered in Rise of the One World Mind include understanding how the One World Mindset is rising, discovering God's blueprint for conquering this mindset in your personal life, being ready for eternity, being equipped for the battle, standing strong as a faithful watchman on the wall, and ultimately having our focus on Jesus. Rise of the One World Mind by Josh Davis. Order your copy today when you call 1-800-652-1144. That's 1-800-652-1144. You can also order at our website, swrc.com. Friends, be equipped and encouraged with Rise of the One World Mind. Order today, 1-800-652-1144. I'm Clayton Van Hus, the director of Affirm, the apologetics branch of Southwest Radio Ministries. And I'm very happy today to be joining you on this special day from the city of Jerusalem in the Holy Land. And why am I in Jerusalem? Well, I'm here for an archaeological dig, but I also am blessed to be able to be here on this day, Shavuot. What is Shavuot? That's probably not a word that you're very familiar with. It is one of the high holy days in Judaism. It actually goes back to uh, remembering the day that God gave the law to the Israelites. And so it is also known as the Feast of Weeks because it's seven weeks after the second day of Passover. It's known to Christians by another name. We usually call it by its Greek name. That name is Pentecost. And what's really cool is while I'm here in the land, I get to go to a very special site that we'll talk about in just a few moments. But what is Shavuot? What is it that makes that holiday one of the special days? Well, it's a biblically ordained holiday. It's one of the days that is given in the Bible, and it's one of the pilgrimage festivals. People would come to Jerusalem to sacrifice from all over the place. And in fact, it's very important to Christians that they did because it was on this day, it was on the day of Pentecost, that of course the Holy Spirit was revealed to the apostles in the upper room, and they went out and they began to speak. They spoke to people. And it was on that day that people were able to understand in their own languages. They accused the apostles of being drunk. And, the, and it was early in the morning. And Peter said, no, it's, it's too early in the morning. We're not out here drunk. As they spoke, the people were amazed because they heard in their own languages. And people were coming from all over the land. Jewish people were living just all over the ancient Near East. They were living in in Persia. They were living in Babylon. They were living just scattered all over the place. They were in Rome. They were in Greece. But they would come to Jerusalem to celebrate this day. And they would come speaking their own languages that they were used to hearing. And when the apostles got up and they told the people about Jesus and they preached the gospel, the people were able to hear it in their own language. One of the interesting things about the day, and we remember this, is the great number of people who were converted, the people who were were saved, who accepted Christ as their Savior on that day. And then, of course, there was a great baptism. Interestingly, we picture 3,000 people being baptized. How did they do that? They needed a place with water. They needed a big place, a place where people could be around water. Now, an interesting thing was going on during this time, during the time of Jesus and the apostles, going back to the Hellenistic period. That's uh, the period between the Testaments when the Greeks were in charge, when, when the Greeks ran the area before the Romans. The Jewish people became so obsessed with ritual purity that they did a lot of interesting things. One, they began to make a lot of stone vessels. And as an archaeologist, already this year, I've found a piece of a stone vessel. These vessels were carved from a a local soft limestone. They were considered clean. There may have been a racket going on with some people 
selling these and telling people, well, if this vessel becomes unclean, all you have to do is clean it. You don't have to break it because they had to break pottery. And let me tell you, digging where I dig at ancient Shiloh, we find about 2,000 pieces of pottery a day. Pottery gets broken in all kinds of ways, but one of the ways is if it becomes unclean, you have to break it. How does it become unclean? Well, if I touch something dead and I touch the pottery, the pottery is unclean. If I touch something dead and I touch you and you touch the pottery, the pottery becomes unclean. So I think there was a lot of breaking of pottery. There were also many other ways to become unclean. You can go back and read the Old Testament. You can read the law and find out how that worked. So they were using the stone for stone vessels because they were obsessed with ritual purity. Well, another thing that they would do because of this obsession with ritual purity is they would baptize themselves, uh, oftentimes once a day. As a Christian, of course, we are baptized once into Christ, but they were baptizing to cleanse themselves. And so they would have a pool, it was called a mikveh, and they would go into this mikveh and they would baptize themselves. And of course, John the Baptist was baptizing people in the Jordan River and in other places. But you could be baptized in a mikveh. You would find those all over the city. In fact, when we dig in this land, we find mikvot, and that's the the plural. We find those all over the place. Anytime you go visit a site, they're there. So I encourage you on this special day of Shavuot to thank the Lord for sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. And so from Jerusalem, I am Clayton Van Hus, director of Affirm Apologetics. Will we succumb to the one world mind or stand out as a beacon of light in the darkness? Be equipped, ready for battle, and encouraged with Josh Davis's new book, Rise of the One World Mind. Order your copy today when you call 1-800-652-1144. That's 1-800-652-1144. You can also order at our website, swrc.com. Rise of the One World Mind, 1-800-652-1144. Ben Franklin said, work as if you were to live 100 years, pray as if you were to die tomorrow. The fate of our world hangs in the balance. Tomorrow, historian and author Bill Federer will show how you are the key to turning things around. Be sure to tune in on your favorite radio station by downloading our SWRC mobile app, or by subscribing to our daily Watchman on the Wall podcast. Watchman on the Wall is a production of Southwest Radio Ministries and is supported by faithful listeners like you. Visit swrc.com.